Hey, what's new and exciting? It's Kevin O'Shaughnessy here, and today I am going to conclude my talk about Master of Puppets. Uh, I could probably go on about this song for weeks, but uh, I think for now, I think this will cover it. So, um, we've been talking about how musical patterns can help evoke emotions when you're writing something or, or playing, and how, you know, it's and, and the point of all of that is to is to give you guys some new ideas on what you can bring to your playing, right? And I've been using Master of Puppets to demonstrate some of this stuff uh, about how a descending musical pattern can make you feel like, you know, the emotion is is sinking into some sort of sadness or anger. We looked at the introduction for that. Um, or how, you know, a, a, a circular pattern, a stagnant pattern that doesn't really travel from one chord to the next can also give you the feeling of just sort of being stuck or spinning your wheels. You know, we also took a look at the, the timing of the verse riff, that three, four bar or whatever you want to call it at the end of the, of the verse and how every member of the band performs it just a little differently um, and how that can have an effect on the sound and the emotional content of that riff. And today we're going to talk about the interlude, okay, that slower, the quiet part in the middle of the song. What that's going to do is that's going to give us an idea of how harmonic rhythm can affect the expectation of the listener and, and possibly bring out some emotional quality in the song. Now, this interlude, this is the part that I'm talking about, you probably know what it is, but it's this. <laughs> Right? So that part right there. Now, most of the time, the way I see it transcribed and the way I see uh, other guitar players talk about this particular pattern is as a 2-4 bar followed by 4-4 four, four bars and then a final 2-4 bar to round out the whole progression, right? So they usually when they count it out, they count out 1-2-1-2-3-4-1-2-3-4-1-2-3-4-1-2-3-4-1-2-3-4-1-2-3-4-1-2-3-4-1-2-3-4-1-2-3-4-1-2-3-4-1-2-3-4-1-2-3-4-
okay? And I'll get to why that's important in just a second. But if we count out the melody, if we listen to the melody, to my ear, it sounds like the timing goes like this. One, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, right? All four, four. And the reason I get that from the melody is those little 16th notes, they really lead into what should be a downbeat following in the next beat, right? So you get one, two, three, four, and a one, two, three, four, and a one, two, three, like that. That leads into a beat that feels like the beat that follows the 16th notes should have more of an accent on it. It should be beat one. And the drums follow with that. If you listen to that, it sounds very much like just a, a, a really straightforward halftime feel over those chords. So what does that mean for our arpeggiated riff up here? Well, it means that the way we should, I think, this is my opinion, it's all subjective, so if you want to argue with me in the comments, please do. The way we should count that out is more like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one. All right, now how does that sound with the arpeggiation? It sounds like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Right? Sounds just a little weird. And to me, that's a whole lot cooler than putting that together with mixed time signatures because it sets up an expectation that gets completely turned on its ear when the rest of the band comes in. Right? That's actually kind of cool. It's kind of deceptive in that way. Now, why do we think that the, this arpeggiated riff is in one time signature, but I feel like the melody is in another time signature? It has to do with the way they're constructed. One of the things that we look at, especially in rock music, is uh, actually, well, no, really, pretty much in, in most forms of music, bass rules. Okay? The bass. Uh, is the thing that gives us our harmonic foundation. Most of the time it's playing the roots of the chords or something related to, um, to the chord in that way. It's not just a random note. It has to be related to the chord. And a lot of times it gives us the root of the chord or maybe an inversion of the chord. And if we listen to the arpeggiated riff, the only time we hear a bass note for each chord is on the first note of that chord's pattern, right? So I get the low E. That's the only time I play that low E is those first four notes. One. And then when I play the D on the D chord, I don't, I don't, that D doesn't come in again, right? It just plays on that first beat. Same thing on the C chord. You only play the C that first time. Same thing with the A, the B, the B over D sharp, same thing, okay? That's why we get the impression that it's two beats followed by four, 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 and then two again to round it out because that's the way the bass line follows with the guitar playing by itself. One, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, right? That's how that sounds because that's the way the bass line goes. But to my ear, especially after the rest of the band comes in, it feels like it's all 4-4. Four, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One. Right? That, again, creates a bit of an offset. You know, to my mind, to count it out like this feels cooler. The phrasing isn't so stuck to the bar. We're actually, we're phrasing over a bar line. And that to me is way cooler than mixing time signatures because it creates, first of all, it creates a deception that doesn't get revealed until the rest of the band comes in because there's no tempo reference at that point. It's just the straight eighth notes. So we don't really know where the downbeat is. We're given the impression by the bass notes in the guitar, but until the drums and the bass and the melody come in, that's when we really get the sense that, oh, wow, yeah, this is just in straight 4-4. But there's that underlying current, the way this is played under that melody, there's this underlying current of uneasiness. And that, to me, is super cool. Because, again, it contributes to the concept of the song. Nothing is right 
in this song. I mentioned in another video that, that my idea about this is that the lyrics, for the most part, with the exception of the bridge that comes in later, the lyrics represent the manipulator and the music represents the manipulated, okay? And so with that, to have these off-kilter moments in the music, right? Like the verse riff, that three, four bar that everybody's interpreting a little differently. To have uh, the phrasing of the chord progression feel different than the phrasing of the melody. All of these little nuances go in to create this sense of unease. Even here, I mean, in this interlude, this really gives me the impression that the junkie's got his fix, right? That's sort of the, I think that's sort of the whole point of this interlude. The junkie's got his fix. And then eventually, you know, he gets high and then the high ends and he comes crashing down. And that's where that master where those dreams that I've been after uh, section comes in, the bridge. So to me, to add these little nuances and these, these slight differences in in feel and the time signatures and stuff like that and those interpretations of different musical patterns that creates that sense of unease throughout the entire song, right? And if the music represents the manipulated, then that makes perfect sense. Do I think this was all planned from the beginning? No. I mentioned before, this is a band who uh, during this period was nicknamed Alcoholica. So I think a lot of this stuff was just a bunch of happy accidents. You know, they had kind of an idea for the song, but all of these little nuances for it kind of happened rather organically as the song evolved. And what we got was this wonderful trifecta of lyrics, meeting music, meeting performance that creates this whole, the, the feeling that is absolutely perfect for the meaning behind the song. So that's what I've got for you today. Go practice the guitar and uh, be sure to hit the notifications bell when you subscribe. And if you got any questions, hit me up in the comments. You can also put in the comments anything that you want me to cover, all right? I'm here for you to help you get more out of the guitar. So with that, I hope you all stay safe. Go practice. I'm Kevin O'Shaughnessy. I will see you in the next video.